Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the Universal Hall. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Anna, Anna Breitenbrach. Anna's traveled from South Africa to be with us, and um, let's give her a warm welcome, please. Right, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to come and learn about talking with the animals. Although it's not just animals I'm going to be speaking with you about. Officially, what I do is called interspecies communication. And that's not a foreign concept to Findhorn for very obvious reasons to do with, well, about 50 years ago, 50 years and some months. Interspecies communication is something that we all can do, so I'm not here to be regarded as you know, special or having been dropped on my head as a baby. <laughs> it's about us all connecting with this uh, intuitive ability we have within ourselves. We may happen to have a particular passion for animals or plants, perhaps the trees or even the elements like the oceans. And this form of communication really applies in so many different ways. So I'm going to talk just for a brief 20 minutes about some of the what it is and how it works. And then we're going to show 15 minutes from a recently completed documentary involving uh, an animal communication case with a black leopard. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the story already and some may not. After the showing of those brief 15 minutes of film footage, we're then going to leave a good 45 minutes for questions and answers from the audience, discussion style, because often I find that's the most helpful. That's where you have the real life situations you might be wondering about back at home, in your gardens, or in your homes that you'd like to ask about. And we can all learn from each other. So don't be shy at that time to make your comments or ask your question. Everyone in the room will benefit from hearing that discussion. So without any further ado, I'm going to pop to and fro a few times for advancing the slides. But let me start with some of the founding statements that underpin our modern way of thinking, rather unfortunately. Aristotle, one of our fathers of philosophy, has implied that nature is just here for our purpose. And Rene Descartes, one of the founding fathers of our modern scientific system, has had very similar things to say, calling ourselves humans the lords and possessors of nature. And this is where we humans, well, even before then, actually, this is where we began to separate from and try to regard ourselves as better than the other species. We use technology, we use our brain size and functioning as, as arguments to support this theory, but it's just a theory. It's just a theory that we made up, that there's some imaginary hierarchy of life, and we happen to be at the very top of this hierarchy. But no one else said it was so, except ourselves. So it hardly seems very objective, does it? At these very critical times, we know for all sorts of reasons that the Earth and our fellow beings, our wild relatives and those that live closer to us are really struggling under the so-called supremacy of our human species. And a whole different way is going to have to be founded. Einstein was a very, very wise man beyond his mathematics and his physics. He really understood that when you take science to its limit, you eventually come up against something more. You come up against something bigger than the empirical and measurable sciences. And he knew, and we are now experiencing, that we have to invent a whole new way of thinking and being and relating to get through this evolutionary crisis, else we're just going to drag all the other species down with us. So what, what is this world that we're actually living in? It's not physical. It's not about the way flowers look. It's not about how many legs an animal has. It's not even about a teacup or a person. Really, on a building block level, we are all made up of exactly the same stuff, which isn't actually stuff, it's energy. But at a quantum level, whether it's a leaf or a coffee mug or a person, we are just collections of quanta that come together to form atoms, which come together to form molecules, which come together to form increasingly complex beings. But at the fundamental building block level, we are all made up of exactly the same stuff. And so why wouldn't we be, ab we be able to connect and communicate with other expressions of life? We are literally of the same energy. We are cut from the same cloth. We humans having brains as we do tend to think 
a lot, too much. <laughs> And every thought or feeling has an electromagnetic consequence in our brain. The synapses fire, there are brainwave emissions, and these really have a frequency that can be perceived by any other aspect of the universe that tunes into us. Much like a cell phone tower or a radio tower that's constantly emitting waves, so we too as humans are walking through our days and the world emitting these, these waves energetically and on a, on a brain level. But connecting with any other being we want to is not just a matter of the mind or this lump of gray matter we call our brain. It's also a matter of the heart, the wisdom of the heart, that feeling of unconditional love and connecting from a place of kinship and recognition. So I'll talk more about that in a moment. The good news is that other animals, non-human animals, are automatically tuned in. They're very open. We know how our cats and dogs at home just know what we're thinking. And if we're feeling sad or bad on a particular day, they might come and show us a little comfort or, or treat us a little differently. Unfortunately, us modern humans have lost the ability to be aware of these things naturally. And we tend to focus only on spoken word and on language, but the animals all around us are constantly sensing us and they know things automatically. They're very good at it. It's us who needs to adjust our frequency to get on the same wavelength as them but animals are always receiving our real thoughts and feelings, and perhaps they're even suggesting some things to us as well. <laughs> if you're sitting at home and suddenly have a thought pop into your head, <laughs> you might be sitting in front of the TV or at your computer, and suddenly you find yourself getting up and walking through the kitchen, outside into the yard, picking up the empty dog's water bowl and filling it with water. It doesn't mean that you suddenly had the bright idea in the middle of your work day that the dog might be thirsty, what would have happened is that your thirsty dog is emitting these feelings and messages of thirst, and eventually you manage to get it on an energetic or a telepathic level. So animals are good at this, they're doing it all the time. These photos were taken on a wild um, dolphin workshop a couple of years back, where completely wild dolphins in the ocean choose to come up to swimmers and interact with us. And they have learned that us humans tend to be pretty silly about things and to think of contact as meaning physical contact of some kind. Look at how many cultures, isn't there the shaking of hands or at the very least eye contact is some way of making connection because we humans think that physical contact is the only way to make connection. And what I've experienced with these dolphins is that they know they're connected energetically, but when they come close to us, they emit the air bubbles out of their blowhole that is their signature pattern. Each dolphin has a little autograph that is a certain pattern of bubbles. And when they come and greet a person for the first time, they always emit their particular autograph, as if to say, hi, I'm Dolly. <laughs> so animals are always adjusting to come into our ways of connecting. They know it's possible to connect energetically. It's really us humans who always think about things quite so physically. Quantum theory and Einstein's relativity theory talk a lot about how this energy transference is possible, and I'm not going to go into that too much now because there's lots and lots of reading material about it, but essentially by directing our attention to another being, we have the ability to tune in and to be on the same wavelength. There's no accident in that expression. It's not just co coincidental to say, be on the same wavelength as someone. It really means you're resonant. That's what attunement is all about. Our, our ancient ancestors knew about this very well. They didn't have to wake up in the morning and sit down in front of their fire and go into a deep meditation to try to connect with the animals. They just simply woke up and thought about the lion in Africa or thought about the kangaroo in Australia and would automatically get information coming into their minds spontaneously about where those animals were. People too, when they were hunter-gatherers, used to know about the plants in these intuitive ways. They would know by direct communication with the plants, which plants might be uh, medicinal and be useful for healing and well-being, which might be toxic or which parts of the plant might be toxic and which might be nourishment as food. And the medicine people of the tribe and the hunters and gatherers would communicate with the plants to ask them about their properties and they would care for the plants. Our indigenous hunter-gatherer ancestors would also communicate with the collective consciousness of a certain species of animal. So if they wanted to go hunting tomorrow, 
Then tonight they would sit in a state of prayer or communication, perhaps with the Kudu nation, and humbly through prayer communicate with all Kudu in the area and request, very respectfully request that one Kudu please show its tracks the next morning so they could follow the tracks because they really needed to feed their family for the next few months. They would always explain their need in a very humble way and never take more than they needed. And then about 12,000 years ago, we humans decided to keep animals behind fences and to grow crops and keep them also, keep more than we needed. And when we started hoarding and keeping more than we needed, we began to make them just resources for ourselves and not be in such a dynamic relationship and respectful relationship with them. There are still some indigenous cultures that carry forward these ways of honoring animals. In Nepal, there's a, an annual day of the dog where all dogs are honored. And everybody puts outside their homes water and food for the stray dogs to come and enjoy. And if the dogs come close enough, they decorate them with garlands of flowers and put turmeric on their foreheads and really revere and honor the animals. So too, there were very close relationships between the indigenous people in Africa and the wild animals too. These days, unfortunately, when we see documentaries, they usually are pitting man against beast and trying to make some big sensational battle of the whole thing, predator and prey. But at the times before modern times, there was a dynamic relationship and a very beautiful way of being and even physical closeness was possible. Not that you should try this at home. <laughs> So what is telepathy? It is direct communication. It's direct communication. The animal might be in the same room as you. The plant might be right in front of you in your garden. It's direct communication. You're not using some distant means of doing a psychic reading. It's a direct communication, like a conversation. And the dog will know that you're speaking with them telepathically, just as you will know. It's a two-way sending and receiving of information. It's completely natural. We know how sometimes we can just tell what someone's going to say before they say it. That's telepathy. So it's not something very new agey or weird or a special gift. We're not predicting the future. We're not in some astral traveling way, um, zooming ourselves over to remote locations to look down and see what's happening there. If we are connecting with an animal who is somewhere else than where we are, we're actually connecting energetically and then asking them to show us where they are or how they're feeling. It's all about directing our attention and our intention. For us humans, that often means eye contact. Some animals don't like eye contact. They take it as threatening, um, or they think it's a game, you know. So it doesn't have to be eye contact, but with animals who live close to people, like our domestic pets, they can often enjoy eye contact for short periods. With our eyes closed, we can still direct our intention to connect towards the one we want to connect with. Animals and plants are sentient beings. Now, a sentient being means one that can think for itself and is self-aware, very much aware of itself, of its individual expression in the universe. Unfortunately, mostly science doesn't really regard animals as conscious beings, so they go through all sorts of experiments to try to, to prove that. Cornell University had a study with elephants who have lived in the same yard in a zoo for several years. And one day they took the elephants away and sedated them and put a cross, a white cross, on the elephant's forehead, like you can see. They also put up a big seven-meter mirror in the elephant's yard, and then they woke the elephants up. And when the elephants were no longer sleepy, they went out into their yard, and of course they went straight to the mirror, thinking, oh, new toy, you know, and they felt with their trunks behind the mirror. But within 90 seconds, they realized they could see their reflection in the mirror. And when they saw their reflection, the first thing the elephants did was, with their trunks, move to the cross on their own forehead and try to wipe away the mark. So this proves that they were understanding their reflection to be a two-dimensional representation of themselves and in reverse, you know, a mirror image. They didn't first try to wipe on the mirror. They straight away realized, whoa, there's something there that shouldn't be there, and tried to wipe the mark away with their own trunks. So animals are self-aware. Every bee in a beehive is aware of its own role and its own purpose. Every tree in a forest is very aware of its family of other trees and of itself, of its own needs and its own life. So plants and animals have their own roles and purposes. 
Perhaps the role of all cats is to find boxes. <laughs> <laughs> And animals have roles and purposes that may have nothing at all to do with us humans or what they're doing in our lives. You know, we so often are very grateful to animals for being guide dogs for the blind or therapy animals or horses that draw carts or other animals that help us. But that doesn't mean their only purpose on the planet is to be in service to us humans. You know, what made us so special? What made us so important? Perhaps we are here to serve them as well. Perhaps we're here to help each other. And different species have got different perspectives about what's important to them <laughs> or about who they'd like to communicate with. <laughs> we do know that cats tend to be more independent, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you might not have a kitty at home who's a very sociable herd animal who loves nothing more than to be in a big family and would love to be around other cats. We know that dogs and horses tend to like to group together and live in packs or in herds. That doesn't mean, though, that the horse or the dog in your life isn't a very independent soul who wants to live alone. We always need to remember that we're dealing with an individual, and we shouldn't be thinking about generalizations about the species or any prior knowledge. We can just simply ask the animals directly how they feel about themselves and hear straight from the horse's mouth. So another thing about animals being self-aware is that they are very able to express empathy, to feel with another being, and to have compassion as well. They can know and understand what it must be like to be um, feeling pain. They feel pain when a member of their family is feeling pain somewhere else. And it's not about brain size, clearly. Modern science tends to think of brain size as meaning very intelligent. Of course it's not. <laughs> It's not at all. <laughs> Empathy can be defined as looking through each other's eyes. For us to truly know and understand another being, we need to be able to look through the eyes, their eyes and see the world from their perspective without thinking about it. And children are very, very good at this. Children have an automatic connection with animals because they are free of lots of ideas or expectations. And animals tune in very easily to kids as well. There's just natural instinctive communication. So all the adults in the audience, be wise and listen to your children and what they're saying about the animals and the plants because they're picking up messages directly. Particularly the younger the child is and the less language is interfered, the more direct knowing is available. Here are some brief examples of compassion and caring between the different species. It's well known the great relationship between elephants and their keepers. That's an orphaned elephant in Africa. These young elephants, if they're orphans, they die from heartbreak unless they have someone with them 24-7. The bottom picture is of an orca and a dog having a little greeting. And the tiger was in the Thailand Zoo. His mother rejected him when he was born, and the only other animal who had young at the time was a pig. So they put him with the pig, and he grew up with his little piglet brothers and sisters, and now they live happily together. And he doesn't think they're food, they're his brothers and sisters. <laughs> So what, would, what do we use telepathic communication for? We use it for all sorts of ways to try to understand animals better so that we can help them meet their wishes or their needs. We can use it for helping veterinarians understand their physical symptoms or describe their physical symptoms to find out what's wrong with them or what care they need. It can help with resolving behavioral issues and various distressing things. Most importantly, though, it can enhance our relationship with them. This was a cheetah I worked with in Canada who'd broken her leg and had to be confined indoors for quite a few months. And with telepathic communication, I was able to keep her calm and help her understand why she had to go through this very terrible imprisonment because it was for her own good. And from time to time, we'd let her, well, look out the window and see where she might be able to walk again one day, which she did. And these photos were taken in Mozambique by a young marine biologist who attended one of my workshops. And a few months later, while snorkeling in the warm ocean, he saw a whale shark that is the sea's biggest fish. I mean, just meters and meters and meters long. You'll see in a moment, relative to a human. And she had fishing line caught around her tail and a hook in her tail, which was obviously uh, reducing her ability to swim so well. So he remembered what he'd learned about being calm and still inside and connecting with her. He explained to her what he was going to do and that he meant well. And then he swam up to her. See how large she is. That's just her tail, and he's an adult man. 
that was potentially very dangerous. If she had just swished her tail, she, she could have knocked him unconscious. But he had explained his intention, and he got a feeling of a yes from her. And this is what he wrote about it afterwards. I told the lady, meaning the shark, exactly what I was going to do. After removing the hook, I actually swam up right next to her face and showed her the hook. She calmly gave this long, paused wink. I'll never forget her expression. So it's very helpful to calm animals down if they are in distress or if a bird has fallen out of the nest. And it's not about physical expression. It's not about facial expression. It's not about interpreting behavior because that is our minds busy trying to interpret things. <laughs> it's definitely not about body language. When us humans see an animal in a certain posture or certain body language, we tend to assume certain things. <laughs> It's really not about body language. Animals are doing what they're doing for their reasons. <laughs> How does it work? Every day we have moments of intuition. We have little gut feelings or little hints or sudden messages fall into our head and we need to learn to trust those. That's really what it's about. And it's about the energy behind the concepts, not the actual words. So sending is automatic. Animals send, we send information and it's really not about the words. <laughs> okay. Us humans tend to hang up on the idea of words, but if we're genuinely in distress and are saying help or ouch or you know, I'm really sore, I'm really unhappy, animals understand the feeling and the energy of it. It doesn't matter what we're actually saying. Luckily, they don't interpret things from a language point of view. And as they say, cats are their own particular species who may not actually talk and definitely are less likely to respond when we want them to. So we need to honor the animals and their species as well. There are simple steps, and we'll talk more about this afterwards, but the very simple steps to intentionally connecting with an animal telepathically or with a plant telepathically, they're very, very simple. So simple that we tend to think, well, they can't be real, or this is too easy, but it's really not a complicated thing. We just have to have our hearts and our minds in the right place. Usually one of the first things to do, therefore, is to relax, to consciously relax. Relaxing the body can help relax the mind, because we need to become still. When our minds are still, we can tap into our deeper knowing, which is the intuition. So being still is very much the first step. Being quiet, not with music or meditation, just being quiet, watching your breathing, and then coming down to being very calm and open, connecting with the heart. It really is about coming down into the wisdom of the heart and to imagine that you're connecting. If you would like, you could have a visualization that imagines you reaching out to connect with the animal. Better to just visualize it than to actually do it, because that might disturb them physically, and that might get your mind all involved in the physical interaction, which it's really not about. It's about being in a quiet space of heart connection. You could imagine reaching out to them, particularly if they're not in the same room as you, because this kind of energy transmission can happen across great distances. The telepathic energy transference is not at all affected by buildings or mountains or distance. You can communicate with a dog in your room or a dog on the other side of the world. But most important is to be quiet. Here at Findhorn, you have very good access to places and practices to instill that. I noticed since my last visit, there's a nice new bright wood sign on the gate of the original garden saying, be still and know. And that is really what it's about. If you become still, you know, you know. You don't think about stuff, you just know. And in that space, you can know the moods and the thoughts and the feelings and the states of being of everything around you, from an ant to an elephant, even if they're not around you, <laughs> from a cauliflower to a tree. It's also about genuinely honoring and having reverence for that other being, not making them smaller than you or less important, but about really respecting them and who they are. And us humans tend to not like some species so much. We tend to have prejudice against things like ticks and mosquitoes. And then because we have a prejudice against ticks, we have a prejudice against the animals who carry ticks, like the deer, and then we don't want them close to us because they might make us sick. And all of these stories and all of these negative thoughts, which only increase our chances of manifesting that very negative thought. If we genuinely understood that, yes, the deer are carrying the ticks and might also become sick from them, we can feel more kindly and understand we're all on the same planet in the same situation. 
if we understand why animals that raid our vegetable garden are hungry, perhaps, or why they're not getting enough nutrition in the very little wild areas that are left, we might feel more kindly to leaving some rows in our vegetable patch for them, or putting some trees in a different location and saying they're welcome to eat off those. It's about living in harmony with nature, and the most amazing reciprocal relationships are possible. It's also about physical considerations. We need to go quietly and perhaps somewhat camouflaged into nature. <laughs> One of my favorite animals in Africa is the meerkat. <laughs> and we can get closer to animals in nature if we are being unobtrusive in the environment, if we're not wearing big bright colors, if we're not talking loudly or thinking loudly, even if our mouths are shut. So it's about having a quiet way of walking and being. It's about being quiet within. That is truly the only requirement for this at all. And when one is quiet within, the most amazing things can happen. I was sitting on a boat in a channel on the coast of South Africa, and a little, I found out afterwards, a white-throated swallow came and sat on the, on the wire, on the stay of the boat, and I wanted to respect his need for a rest, I thought, so I moved away, and he followed me, and I moved around to the other side of the boat, and he followed me, and eventually I communicated with him, and he was just curious. You know, who are you and what do you feel like? So I offered my hand so he could feel what I felt like and he hopped onto my hand. And we had a lovely chat about the weather, literally about the weather, <laughs> because the weather matters to a young swallow trying to fly across a channel. So amazing things can happen when you're genuinely open and peaceful. Had I been trying to have a connection with that sparrow and in, within myself reaching and grabbing for it, I bet it wouldn't have happened because I would have been wanting something of that experience. It comes down to shared awareness. Beyond words, beyond physical action, and beyond behavior, it's about being in a space with an animal, with a plant, with a flower, touching or not, and about being in a state of shared awareness. It doesn't always have to be this huge conversation where there's question and answer to and fro. Just sitting quietly in the, in the presence of another is a beautiful communion, even if it's not a communication. And our dear Dorothy has this lovely transmission from the plant kingdom. And this is truly how I experience it as well. We quietly radiate to you, and it is as if you must stop and listen to us. You know, all of nature, all around us, is constantly radiating and being authentic and expressing who they are. All we have to do is slow down and stop long enough to be still to hear. And that's the invitation for, for all of us in our daily lives. Because we are, on a building block level, all parts of the same universe, and exactly the same kinds of parts. We're in this constant flow and motion. So why not enjoy the dance and get to know our dancing partners, every aspect of the plant, animal, mineral, elemental kingdom around us. Okay, down to some nitty gritty. John mentioned in the beginning the workshops. I'll be back in August um, facilitating a couple of workshops. The adult ones we call workshops, the kids ones we call fun shops. Sorry for the adults. <laughs> so from the 3rd to the 5th of August, Saturday to a Monday, and the following week the same again. Those are interspecies communication workshops where we go into a lot of detail about all the how, all the techniques, so-called, for how, but it's very practical, very experiential. We get into real communications, both or photographs of animals that I know and you don't, so that you can test yourselves and have your answers validated. We also go out and about on the property. Uh, the first workshop, I believe, will be at the park and the second at Clooney. So we go and work with real life situations or negotiations between different plant species or plants and animals or animals and humans, and we get very practical with it. And there's a lot of individual mentoring as well. So by the end of those two and a half, three days, you've absolutely got all that you would ever need to go and continue practicing with. Most of the workshop is really just about how to get out of our own way. So those you can inquire more about the, at the bookings office, there are still spaces on both of those workshops. And then uh, in addition, on the Tuesday, the 6th of August, uh, for the young children in the mornings and for teens in the afternoon, because there will be a program by then, I'll also be offering a couple of hours uh, that's free of charge for any children who want to come along. And then we're just going to go and get dirty and play with the animals and the plants and communicate with them out there in the woods and the beach. So all kids are most welcome to that as well. 
And if you want to know more about my other offerings in the UK, Germany, or elsewhere in the world, my website is animalspirit.org. I also teach online, um, doing webinars and free seminars about associated topics. It really is my passion and my pleasure to be able to spread this amongst other humans to help us remember, because when we remember our ways of being related, all of life benefits. We benefit the most, I think, but hopefully we can have positive effects on the other beings who share our lives too. And that's just the way it used to be and the way it can be again. So thank you all for being here. What we're going to do is switch right into some video footage. It's just about 12 or 13 minutes long. And this is from a case involving a black leopard in South Africa. This black leopard had been in, was born in a Belgian zoo and had never come out of his night shelter there, so the zoo got pretty upset because he wasn't being a good exhibit. He wasn't coming out of his night shelter, which is you know, a tiny, tiny little area. And so they sold him. They sold him to a breeding farm in South Africa, and then he didn't produce cubs. So then they were upset because he didn't do as they wished. So they sold him on again to a cat park that I, that I, where I came to meet him. By then he was seven years old, and when he got to the cat park for the first six months there, until the day I went to meet him, he also never came out of his night shelter, which is a small concrete enclosure about the size of a double bed. By then he was completely fed up with humans, very angry with people. And they had never intended to try to handle him or touch him directly. He's way too wild and very dangerous. But when, the, when the, um, the caretaker of the place just tried to put some meat through the fence into his night shelter to, to make friends with him, this black leopard named Diablo came charging straight through two sets of electric fence that were on. Broke through the fence, um, knocked the six foot four man to the ground, bit on his arm so badly, put him in hospital for a week, and then he went back through the hole in the fence and went back to his night shelter. So that's where the story starts. Um, they were just completely desperate to try to find out what on earth was going on with this animal and why he was so unhappy. So we're going to watch that, and after that we'll take questions and discussion points. Okay. Even after everything that I've experienced with um, Anna and, and spending all that time with her, there's a that scientific control, you know, sort of rational part of my brain still has doubts. So I wonder what it will take to totally convince me. And then a unique opportunity presented itself. In the course of my work, I had come across the story of Jörg Olsen, an ex-policeman turned conservationist. Jörg and his wife Karen set up the Jukani Predator Park. Here, many big cats rescued from bad zoos and canned hunting farms are offered a home and get lifetime care. Jörg has a remarkable relationship with his cats and he handles them in a way I have seldom seen before. from a European zoo where he'd been abused. That experience had made him suspicious and vicious. All he did was sit in his night shelter and snarl at anyone who came close to him. Six months in, and Jörg was at a loss as to how to deal with this cat. The whole atmosphere there, there was a vibe of aggression and of, um, I hate you and I will kill you. And, you know, the one encounter I had with him um, he sent me to hospital one bite, one week. Here, I thought, was the perfect case. If Anna could get this animal to change his behavior and become well-adjusted, then I would have no choice but to acknowledge that she was in dialogue with animals. It took me some time, however, to convince Jörg to bring in Anna. He's a dangerous cat. He's very, very dangerous. Um, he's towards me and towards everybody else. 
In my opinion, the chances of an animal communicator changing that, um, it'll take a lot to convince me. Um, I honestly do not believe that an animal can talk to a human or communicate with a human. Um, I've had animals my whole life. Um, we give them commands, we give them instructions, and they do it as we habituate them, basically. Um, but I, I'm very skeptical to think that an animal like Diablo will communicate or can communicate with humans. Um, I am desperate, however. I do not want to lose him. I made sure that Anna had no information on Diablo or his history before she came to speak to the Black Leopard. I was nervous to see what would happen as this animal never let anyone near his night shelter without a lot of snarling and growling. But the minute he saw Anna, he calmed down and let her kneel right outside and look at him. This beautiful black leopard that you've asked us to communicate with is very overawed by his new surroundings, having come from a very uh, cramped and stressful place for him. That This place has been provided for him, but he's been quite conditioned by a very unfortunate past. Um, he doesn't want much to do with humans as a result. He's immensely powerful, and I mean not just physically, which you well know and respect, but he's immensely powerful with uh, a wisdom and an energetic presence and personality that is far bigger than anyone has ever appreciated about him before. And he commands a certain amount of respect for that. Again, not in a needy way, but really just out of, by virtue of who he is as a being. There's a very particular thing about his name, uh, Diablo. He wants that name changed because he doesn't like the associations with it, the blackness, the darkness, the diabolical. And when asking him about his past before coming here, he shows concern for two young cubs that were next to him. He's asking what happened to them with a great sense of, of care and concern. We actually forgot about that. When we went to fetch him, there was so much excitement about bringing him back here. Um, it actually slipped my mind until she said, um, he asked about the two cubs. And then we remembered there were two little young leopard cubs next door to him that came from Rustenburg. And they were s sort of semi-wild. They weren't hungry yet. And it just slipped my mind. And when they talked about it, I couldn't believe, I, I actually did believe it. I mean, then I really believed that they were communicating. I mean, she communicated with him, and when we spoke to her and she relayed all the information back to us, the first day I didn't believe her. You know, what, uh, you know, it's things that anybody can think out, and you can think, you know. And then she said something about the cubs that was with him, that were with him. Um, and that changed this whole thing because now all of a sudden, you know, that's something that she didn't know about. And I've also reassured him that you have no demands of him here, that you're quite happy to um, not make any physical demands of him or any expectations for display or interaction, that you're really willing to let him be how he wants to be. And that's given him an enormous sense of relief, yeah. And having told him that has for the first time made him actually, uh, actually genuinely interested in now exploring a bit further. Now that he feels that he's not being asked to come out more, he's genuinely interested in being relaxed enough to have a natural curiosity come out and to actually expand his horizons a bit. And Yeh was just stunned when the Black Leopard walked out of his night shelter into the larger enclosure later in the afternoon. In the six months that the cat had been here, Yeh had never seen him out of the night shelter. He then decided to rename the leopard Spirit.
we told him that same afternoon that we're not going to call him Diablo anymore. Um, and we understand and we agree with that the, the, the diabolical side of it. That's not what he is to us. Um, and we'd like to change his name to Spirit. As I walked to him, I thought, listen, he asked about the two young leopards. And I thought, well, I'm here now. There's nobody else here. I'm not going to look like a fool if something, if I, if he ignores me. Um, I'll tell him what, what happened to those leopards. And I told, and as I called him and I said, Spirit, and he was looking at me, he was lying like that. I said, with regard to the two little leopards, I just want to assure you, I want to tell you that they're safe. And I couldn't help it. I just said to him, wow, you're beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, that's moy. That's moy. And he gave me that, oh. And I thought, what's happening here? And I said to him, you understand what I'm telling you if I say to you that you're the most stunning cat? Oh. And I spoke to him and he answered me about 19 times. And he just sat there and he was totally relaxed. Um, it's the first time, it's the first time since we had him that I felt at ease with him. I felt that he was relaxed and he understood me. It was, to say that I don't know what it feels like for him. For me, it was the most amazing moment. Later that afternoon, Anna came back to check up on Spirit and to see how he was doing. I'm asking him now about how he experienced the communication from Jochen through the fence. And he said it's the first time that someone has directly expressed to him verbally um, appreciation for who he really is, not how they see him to be. And that really surprised him. <laughs> He shows me an image of literally stopping in his tracks by surprise at that sense of just this wall of appreciation coming towards him. He is so relieved that nothing's being demanded of him here. He's just so relieved. It's like this weight has lifted from his shoulders. <laughs> and when he was grunting back, he said he was saying thank you for the thank yous. So each thank you he was getting, he was saying thank you back. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to say about that feedback? I think we'll talk about this a bit later. I can't listen. It's two different animals. It's two totally, totally different personalities. We had a snarling cat, angry at everything, um, upset about being here, hating humans, hating us for having him here, um, you know, ready to kill in an instant. To this relaxed, black leopard that's lying on top of his log in his shelter is this attitude of you recognize me for who I am now and it's amazing to to talk to him and get the talking and get him to talk back to us. Yach and Karen attended Anna's workshop on animal communication and now use it regularly with all their animals. Yeah he, uh, he changed my whole life um, and spirit and animal communication has taught me you know, when I work with, with my other lions, um, the reactions you get, the, the communication you get back, the feelings you get. Um, you know, you get, sometimes you get the lions or Queenie, for instance, that's unhappy with something that happened. And I'm not sitting out there wondering what's wrong with her. She tells me, and I can correct it, and I can make her happy because she is in my, I have to look after her, I've got to make her happy. Um, it changed the whole family. The opportunity for every individual on the planet to connect again with nature is right there on our doorstep. It's a matter of simply looking up into the sky to notice the clouds and wind direction, to pay attention to the sounds of the birds around, to feel what it's like 
to have bare feet on the earth and to notice with our own bodies and our five senses what's going on around us. And that will result in us developing a more intuitive and natural way of knowing how to treat our environment. It's not supernatural. It is supernatural, as in very natural. It's the blueprint of our brains. These ways of knowing and communicating were the way of all our human ancestors. We see how our children come alive when they are out in nature. And as adults, we must remember that we are living in a world borrowed from our children's future. This is a most delicate time in human history on the planet. And for sure, the future of the planet and all her inhabitants rely on what we do now and what choices we make. Those choices can be informed by what the animals are telling us if we are just willing to listen and to hear. Perhaps the only real question for us humans is how are we going to respond? I have a problem with communication, with my own, with other people. And I was laying six weeks before next to a shaman. Mm. And afterwards, I hasn't, uh, I haven't, I haven't no more so much sadness. Mm. And just, uh, it comes in my mind. Uh, maybe I could um, stay in contact with her now, or in the night, or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can we learn, as humans, uh, to to be connected mm. with people? They help us mm. to um, heal or something mm. you know, to, to grow. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, yes, um, the matter of this kind of intuitive connection between people, human to human, is, is a question that I often get asked. With the animals and with the natural kingdom, there's not really considerations for things like um, what we might call permission or agreement, because the animals are their own selves, and if we wish to connect, they either will connect with us, or they won't. There'll either be a sense of agreement and arising to that or not, and that would be their authentic truth. When it comes to humans, though, it's a little more tricky <laughs> because all, all humans, whether you know, shamans or healers or, or ordinary walking around in the world kinds of folks, all of us are very occupied in our five senses and with our conscious minds every day. And yes, we are intuitively connected already, we just don't really know about it consciously because we're so busy with other kinds of thoughts. Connection or um, intuitive connection is often automatically there with people who are already emotionally close or with people who, with whom you've had a very strong bond or mutual purpose uh, or healing intervention or some kind of caring uh, scenario. So two things are true. Firstly, the intuitive connection is already there between you and whoever you've encountered. You know, it is already there. Um, if you would like to, the other thing that's true is that you may not be aware of it as an actual conversation. And if you do want to engage in a telepathic or intuitive conversation, a to and fro, sending and receiving with another person, then it's always a good idea to speak with them about it in the normal sense, to speak with them first and to get their agreement so that you know there is definitely trust and that everything has been stated. Um, but there's no boundaries to it actually being true. It's just a good idea to speak with the person first and to get their agreement um, and then to continue spontaneously or at, at very specific times that you want to actually have a communication. Distance is no barrier. And this can be a very fun way to practice, by the way, as well. If you want to find a, a telepathic buddy to practice with, you can practice sending each other you know, colors or shapes or mental pictures and see how close you are to getting it correctly. It can be a lovely way to practice with someone that you do, you do trust. Yeah. 
Thank you. Hello, Anna, Ian in the lighting booth. <laughs> right. So, um, people may not be aware, they've seen the cameras. We have about 50 people around the world um, joining us. Great. <laughs> and um, this, I've got two questions. The quick one is, um, Art in San Diego would like to know where he can get your DVD from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the longer question from Becca is, I always feel bad about animals being kept in zoos. Mm -hmm. Are animals aware that their species need help and are zoos helpful? Mm. Great questions. Well, thank you. <laughs> the answer to the first question is really easy. The DVD is available for purchase as a Region 2 DVD, which means that in San Diego you would need to play it over uh, through a computer, Mac or PC, because Region 1 DVD is not yet available. Nonetheless, the, you can either find details on the resources page of my website, animalspirit.org, or you can go straight to the online um, catalogue, the online company. It's kalahari.com. Kalahari, like the desert, K-A-L-A-H-A-R-I. Kalahari.com, and they do ship worldwide. They've already sent several to California. The second question is a very good question, and I came into doing this work um, in animal communication in, in a very sideways manner, and it was by actually volunteering at zoos and animal shelters and in conservation programs, and I was very distressed by the state of a lot of animals in those captive environments, because they are very unhappy. A lot of them have got that glazed-eyed look where they're not really engaged anymore. Um, they just have lots of people's thoughts and worse, you know, objects being thrown at them on a daily basis, and they just disconnect. They disconnect from their reality as a way to keep sane inside and and become just really you know, very depressed. So the thing is, uh, I'm certainly not going to go into justifications for why zoos are helpful to have people you know go to see animals and at least care about them. And I also certainly never buy into the argument that zoos and breeding are necessary for saving the wild species. So many places pretend to be conservation programs and breeding to save the gene pool when they're actually just tourism establishments making money off entrance fees. But having worked for at least 10 years in these kinds of environments, there were individual animals that I would come across who were very, very clear in themselves that their purpose was to live in captivity and to touch the hearts and the minds of people who came to visit that zoo or that park. And they were the animals who were always bright-eyed and welcoming. It doesn't mean one could touch them. Sometimes you could, sometimes you couldn't. That wasn't the point. They didn't need physical touch. But they were very clear that their role and their purpose was to be a, an ambassador for their wild cousins so that they could help uh, have people experience them and therefore perhaps care, care about that species and therefore care to help or donate money or other resources towards saving the habitat and, the, and their wild cousins. So I would say on a case-by-case -case basis, one would need to look at the individual animals there, how they are feeling about it. A lot of my work, at least half my work, is with wildlife, usually in captive scenarios or in relocation programs or programs to return them to the wild. And I'm called in to ask what the animals need to be more comfortable, to have their lives more enriched. What do they need on an activity level, on an environment level, food, diet, interactions, and all those sorts of things. So to say that all animals in zoos are just dying to be free <laughs> would also be not true. That would be a generalization. At the cheetah park where I volunteered on weekends, we often had people come and get all sad and say, oh, look, that cheetah just wants to run free across the African plains. Meanwhile, most of those cheetahs had been born in captivity, were very well fed every day, and could think of nothing more scary than being out on the African plains having to find their own food. <laughs> so it really comes down to the individual animal. It's pretty obvious if an animal is happy or unhappy in a captive scenario, and what I can suggest and how we all can absolutely help is if we visit such a place, is to send them compassion to open our heart centers and to let them know that we really see them. We really see them, we feel for them and with them. Don't pity them. If we feel sympathy towards them or if we pity them, that's not very helpful. That just makes them feel even worse and it's very disempowering. Better to send them unconditional love and to essentially just say and to feel, you know, I see you, I see you, and to hold them in the light. 
and that honestly does improve their experience of their life that day for having been fully seen and having had a touching moment with a person energetically. Great. Question. Um, I, I wish to appreciate your being here, first of all, but I have two questions. One is, uh, do animals like spirit form an, um, an emotion from a feeling? Mm -hmm. was, it, was the feeling that he, uh, in, where he was brought up, did it create an emotion? And do animals understand emo human emotions? Mm. Is the first part of your question, are you asking, does the animal have an emotion come up? Yes. Or, okay. yes. Right. Um, animals are very, very present, and boy, can we learn a lot from them, from that point of view. As a spiritual state of being, you know, animals are so present, which means, yes, they do have um, feelings come and go and reactions to things in perhaps an emotional way, but those don't tend to last. Those feelings won't last, they don't really hold grudges, unless you've been away from home for too long and your domestic cat lets you know when you get back. <laughs> but they have feelings, yes, they do have feelings, and they would experience them as emotions. They might get a flash of aggression, or a sense of um, longing, or sadness, uh, so they certainly do. But they don't attach to them in the same way that humans do, and they certainly don't, after the fact of feeling it, sit around and think about it some more. So they don't just tend to sit there and think about feelings. But of course, if they feel the same thing around a certain person often enough, they have memory as well, and they can know what's causing their distress, or they can describe what situations do. When it comes to the question of do animals understand human emotions, <laughs> they know we have them, and they read human emotions absolutely accurately in the moment, but they don't understand why we have so many, and why we're so conflicted, and why we, re we react so much. Um, animals are very aware that most of the time we're, we are not present. So they sense our emotions, including if we are unsure. Uh, you might be out at the park or on the beach, and you see someone whose dog has got away from them off the leash, and they really, really want the dog to come back. And the person is very angry that the dog has got away. But they know that anger is not going to attract the animal, the dog, back to them. So they might be calling the animal, the dog, you know, here Fido, with a sweet little voice, and even offering a treat, and here Fido, a good dog. But behind their back, the dog can't see, you can see they've got a stick. And they intend to beat the dog and you know, punish it when it gets there. And you'll see Fido's response. Fido's hearing the right words and the right tone of voice. He's even having the treat dangled and everything looks good. But Fido's unsure because he can also absolutely sense the negative intentions of the person. He can sense that all is not well, that there's something else happening in parallel. And so Fido might come back a little half-heartedly with tail between the legs you know, sort of getting mixed, get, getting mixed messages, because a lot of the time we ourselves as humans are just mixed up in our, in our own heads. That's also another reason why it's impossible to, um, to fake confidence around animals. If you are genuinely feeling afraid or feeling fearful, they will know that. You can't pretend not to, because they'll pick up on that frequency. Is it okay to ask a question about my own animals and the situation mm. we're in, please? You're welcome to. I will just say I won't be able to tell you why your animal's doing what you're doing. All right. If that's because I'm not a behaviorist and I don't believe in generalizing. So, no, it's uh, not. so in a situation, I would say one would have to ask the animal why they're doing what they're doing, what their reasons uh, are. But if it's still relevant um, mm. as a... It, it's actually about... Um, my three female guinea pigs who all have cystic ovaries mm -hmm. and I'm and everybody I've spoken to is at a loss as to why mm. we have this problem mm. and I'm not quite sure what to do about it. Yes, quite. If if you have a situation where all the animals in the household are displaying the same sorts of symptoms like that, um, it would imply there's something going on either in the environment, physically, you know, or energetically, or that they're taking on unless they're related to each other, and it could be a genetic thing. Um, so there, there are often energetic reasons for animals' ailments, particularly animals that live close to people. They might um, display an illness that is actually trying to give us a message. So a domestic animal may develop a liver disease, and perhaps they're trying to tell us we should have our livers checked out, or that we are too much in the emotions that are associated with liver, like anger, resentment, those sorts of things. Sometimes animals take on a physical illness to help us not get so sick, 
and, and that might be um, an act of service on their part and therefore an appropriate choice because they're making it from a centered place within themselves. Sometimes animals get sick though because they're reflecting to us what's going on or they've ident over identified with us and it's not coming from such a centered place in themselves. Yeah. But the thing to do in that scenario would probably exactly to have a communicator ask all three of them together um, do they know? Animals, most of the time, absolutely know what's going on with themselves and why, what, what the causal reasons are. Yeah, thank you. And yes, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, I've recently um, have noticed around um, my friend's dog, my friend's dog usually really jumps at me mm. when I go near it. And I've noticed recently that I've been, actually I've been sitting with my rabbit and being quiet and choosing, and choosing love, being more, working mm. on my own centeredness. Mm. Mm. And I've noticed that recently the dogs stopped jumping at me. Great. Which is just amazing. I no, I've noticed mm. it, I've thought about it, I haven't really said anything but mm. I've noticed it. Mm. And I wondered about, um, if you talk a bit about how animals respond mm. to our fear. Mm. So if I'm fearful, then does that bring a certain does that bring a certain response or reaction? Mm. Do they respond? Do they react? That they very often they very often do. If if we are feeling fearful or nervous in ourselves, animals will definitely know that, and they might choose to move away and stay a bit away from us. Therefore, because they just feel misunderstood. Particularly if it's, for example, a large breed dog. That, is, that you, you know, I've been at the vet before with a friend's dog, a big German shepherd, and the mother and her eight-year-old daughter walked into the vet's reception area, and when the mother saw the German shepherd, she grabbed her daughter by the arm, actually hurting her daughter, and said, stay away from that dog, he's dangerous. Just because he's a German shepherd, and he's the biggest teddy bear, the most gentle dog I've ever known. And so animals feel that. They feel assumptions, they feel negative um, opinions about them. Um, and they feel our fear. They may choose to just recede, or they may come towards us if we're feeling fearful. And then again, there might be a couple of reasons. Um, sometimes they can just sense fear in the field, really, right around, and that makes them think, gosh, there must be something scary here. You know, there must be something worthy of being fearful. So everything just sort of escalates. They think less clearly, we think less clearly. They just sort of get very tense, even if they don't come towards us, but they might get very tense because suddenly fear is in the field and they go into an instinctive high alert state. Sometimes when we're fearful or when we really don't like an animal, they will come to us um, as a deliberate attempt to try to convert us. And the classic example of this is cats. People who don't like cats will walk into a room and any cat around will go to that person. <laughs> and that's very often because they are saying, oh, you know, I see this and I'm going to just try and teach you otherwise. So there can be many reasons why, why they do. But yes, the moment there's fear, they can sense that as well. And um, when fear is around, then it's impossible to be present, to be fully present. Those two are mutually exclusive. So animals are very present. When we bring fear into the situation, we're not very present, and that just is a bad start to a relationship in a moment and, and to relating. I'm sure that your work with your rabbit, though, has absolutely, in an ongoing way, beyond the rabbit moments, transformed your inner reality, and the dog is picking that up. As a brief aside, if dogs are jumping up or if animals are doing things with their bodies that uh, you're concerned about perhaps hurting you or guests who arrive, and if you are suggesting to animals what they should do instead, like you want the dog to not jump up anymore, it's always important to phrase the message in the positive. So if a dog's coming towards me and jumping up and going to knock me over, it's not a good idea for me to say, don't jump up, don't jump up. Because unconsciously, I've got the quantum holograph or the mental image of the dog jumping. I'm just reinforcing that. And the don't gets lost along the way. The universe doesn't understand don't. Rather think of the positive version of what you would like them to do and suggest that. So I always say, keep all four feet on the ground, all four feet on the ground. And then they get that, They're like, oh, oh, okay. And still allow them to greet you like dogs want to do. But always suggest things in the positive rather than the double negative. Great. Hi. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the story of Diablo spirit um, is hugely you know, effective and, and, mm -hmm. and impressive. Um, but what strikes me about it is 
the effect that you were able to have on that leopard um, when the people who owned it obviously mm. cared about it already mm. very hugely. Mm. So it rather suggests that you have genuinely exceptional abilities, and although I applaud your intention to try to increase people's awareness, change their attitudes towards animals and mm. nature, have you ever met anybody who is as good as you are? Number one. <laughs> Number two, um, I'm, I, I sat at dinner with Alistair Black, who told me that you were working with one of his colleagues, mm. taking people on safari into wilderness areas. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be curious about you know, what, what the plan is or what the intention is there. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, I'm wondering if, um, if animals are aware of humans and, you know, poaching type humans mm. and whether there's anything that can be done um, with the animals mm. to shift that situation. Mm. Great, thank you. I'll try to remember all of those three. <laughs> if you don't, I will remind you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I don't have exceptional abilities. However, this is my passion and my calling, and so I've paid a lot of attention and time to it in the last 12 years since I jumped ship from my IT career into doing this and finally followed my bliss. So perhaps the combination of really combining my passion with this as a calling has put me in the position of doing the right thing for me, and, and therefore you know, it's, it's also something I do every day, so I'm much more practiced, and practice does make perfect, it really does. Yes, I do have colleagues around the world, other animal communicators, um, who are as good as me, if you want to use that terminology, which is a strange sense to me, but we often um, check in with each other around difficult situations or really dire situations where a rhino is you know, badly injured and there's poaching and that sort of thing, and we always get exactly the same messages in our communications. So we sort of double-check each other, if I can put remotely. it that way. Remotely. Excuse me? Remotely. Yes, remotely, yes, yeah, remotely. I'll talk about more about the remote thing in a moment. So, um, about uh, Diablo renamed Spirit, yes, the people did care about him very much, and they were desperate to try to um, have him be happy and try to have him come out of his night shelter. And that desperation of theirs is not unlike the question about fear that we just had. That desperation comes with a certain anxiety, and it's just focused on what they want him to do, you know, come out, come out, albeit for his own good. What also is not mentioned in the documentary is that that is an animal park where they conduct daily tours and the tour guide's script was to keep on telling Diablo's uh, sad story. And so several times a day in front of his night shelter where no one could see him anyway, there were words being said about you know, abused in the European zoo and so unhappy and depressed and aggressive. So this was being reinforced several times a day, day after day after day. And um, with, with the best of intentions, they were inadvertently making his situation worse by throwing those sorts of feelings at him. And I'm really just an interpreter or translator. It's not, uh, you know, yes, animals tend to trust me maybe because of my um, willingness to be on the same wavelength as them. And the work I've done to clear myself of projections or expectations or prejudices against species. So perhaps I'm a bit more of a clear container because of personal spiritual work I've done on myself, but I'm really just the interpreter. That was all just about me conveying his message to his keepers, and Jörg, right that same day, decided, he went to the tour guides and he said, you will never ever again say a negative word about him or tell his sad past and tell his story. We're gonna scrap that from the script and we're gonna rename him and that's it. And it was because Jörg and the staff did that, that spirit responded so positively and then gave that feedback. Mm. So, the second question was? Mm -hmm. The wilderness trips. Oh yes, the wilderness trips, yes. Um, Peter Raimondo is a wilderness guide in South Africa and we run wilderness trails that are between seven and 10 days long. What is very special about being in the wilderness and communicating with animals telepathically is that it's very, very different, again, to how a lot of the animals experience humans in the tourist sense. Even on safaris, there's people with cameras who want something from them. They want the photograph or they want to point at them and they just see them as objects. Here we go on foot, we sleep under the stars, no tents, no communications. We are literally humbling ourselves and making ourselves no greater than the animals. And we will inevitably have encounters with them on foot, 
that we don't, well, that we are looking after you know, safety and, and possible interaction dynamics. We're very much about connecting with the animals and their truths, understanding from them how they're feeling about our presence and do they want us to move away or move around. And just on the last trip back in March, we had an incident, it was a very hot day, about 42 degrees Celsius. Very hard to imagine in the Scottish <laughs> summer. <laughs> and we were desperate. In fact, we needed to gather water from the river to be able to drink. We completely ran out of water. But a bull elephant was 100 meters back from the water and he really, really wanted to get in as well. So he was nervous of us, we were perhaps more nervous of him. And he had every right of way, we wanted to make sure he could go, but he conveyed to me he was still very, very nervous and would rather hang back. So I said to him, telepathically, across the river, a great distance, I said, OK, well, we'll also just sit here quietly. When I turned my attention away, some of the men decided to go into the river. They couldn't wait any longer. And the first I knew about it was this um, perturbed message from the elephant, basically saying, hey, you broke the deal. You yeah, know, the people are in the water now. You broke the deal. And he began flapping his ears and wanting to mock charge. So I apologized immediately and explained that I had not actually conveyed that to the men. My bad, I didn't tell the other humans that I'd made that deal with the elephant. They had changed their minds without knowing any different. And so called them out of the water. And he were right away transformed. He understood that it had been a mistake in the human communication. And he was then very happy to come down to the water to do his business and then move away so that we could have a turn. And there's lots of encounters with wildlife, um, injured or otherwise, who will often take very close contact when they know that the human is being genuinely respectful and honouring their needs and their wishes. So those wilderness trails are all about being in a very five-sensory way, in the wild, um, with nature, on a completely even footing, so to speak. We don't have any other privileges, um, we don't have any superiority over them, and the encounters are very close and very wonderful because once again they're truly seen and when it's being meeting being in nature we too are just like another animal on the landscape and it feels like I imagine being one of our native ancestors might be where there's a very real relationship with the earth with the waters with the animals we have baboons roosting next to us if we choose to camp on some cliff faces just amazing for those who might be interested the next trail is from the 10th until the 16th of October and Details are on the website, animalspirit.org. Mm. And your last question about poaching. Every 18 minutes in South Africa, a rhino is poached. We really don't have many left. And several other species are losing their lives as well because of people hunting them for their ivory. And uh, myself and other communicators help where we can. However, the problem is we don't know from which direction the danger is going to come. And nowadays, a lot of the poaching is done from helicopter. Within 25 minutes, the whole thing has been started and finished. They drop the poachers with their guns from helicopter, they saw off the animals' horns, and then get back in the helicopter, and it's all over within 25 minutes. Interspecies communication, telepathic communication, has been very helpful in warning animals. So I often am involved in warning animals about farmers who want to shoot them, or where there might be traps or fence lines or busy roads, or if we know there's a weak point on the border of a reserve, to ask the animals to avoid that area and literally visualize them moving to a different part of the reserve. Last week, while I was sitting here writing, I was involved with a white lion project in South Africa who were introducing two new lionesses from a different reserve. And if they meet the existing lions too soon, it could be a real bloodbath and many lions would be killed. Um, and they didn't want to have to sedate and anesthetize the, the resident lions while they brought in the others, because they had to go through the reserve to get to the, the enclosed area. So they asked me to communicate with the resident lions and ask them to, for that day to please move all the way to the northeastern corner of their reserve. So I sat here in Fendorn at 58 degrees north <laughs> and imagined myself at 34 degrees south and imagined the direction northeast from that reserve, what northeast would be in terms of quality of light at a certain time of day. and just using my intention to call up those specific three lions, I asked them to please move away, move away, move towards the northeast and to stay there until sunset. And I got feedback saying that's exactly what they did. I also described to the lions why they should do that. It needs to make sense for them. But they need to want to do it for their own reasons. So it's not just because we ask them, they should do it. 
I explained that if they didn't do that, they would have to be darted and go through the stress and go to sleep and then be groggy for a few days. So that them agreeing to do this would be much more comfortable for them. And that's why they did agree. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. You talked about a lot of vertebrates, mammals and mm. birds, and one very big fish. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering what experience you have or thoughts you have about the mind or contact with some of the insects. Mm. But um, in particular, I'm thinking the hive creatures like mm. ants and bees, where, well, some of the bees, where um, the individual has one state of being, but then it's also part of mm. a much greater whole, I guess everything is. But mm. um, yeah, it, it, have you experience of communicating with, say, a colony of ants mm. and an individual ant? And mm. yeah, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. In fact, Dorothy and I were speaking about this the other evening, comparing notes on our communications with insects. And connecting with an individual insect is a wonderful thing to do. In fact, connecting with any species that you don't know a lot about is a really great thing to do, because then you come to experience their reality in a way that you don't have preconceptions about. So you know it isn't your mind just suggesting things to you. So choose any insect. Go out into your garden and choose an insect to connect with, and simply ask them, what is it like to see through your eyes? And I guarantee you, you have the most amazing experience of this mosaic vision and jigsaw puzzle-like experience. Um, yes, animals that live together in flocks or swarms or hives or herds for that matter, they are in the same moment aware of themselves as an individual and what they are doing and how they're feeling. And also their um, collective identity and what role they play in the collective. And it's as if they're a particle in the ocean of that collective and they move for the benefit of the benefit of the collective. Every decision they make in a moment about which flower to go to is informed by the collective impulse and the collective good, something us humans could definitely learn from. When I was doing my advanced training in this about 12 years ago, there were six of us communicators at a wildlife ranch in Texas that was filled with African animals, very strange, and there was a whole herd of impala, and we were all asked to separately go in different directions and to ask different individual impala exactly the same questions about herd life, about decisions they made about the herd and the group collective. I always remember <laughs> one answer. The question was, what do you do when you get stressed? So there's six communicators asking six different impala, what do you do when you get stressed? And all of us got exactly the same answer, which was just eat grass. <laughs> and they weren't talking about marijuana. <laughs> they essentially meant get back to basics, you know, just go back to basics. So there's a beautiful pulse of wisdom going through a collective, and the individuals know who they are as well. It was on that same workshop that I noticed a sunflower that was buzzing with so many bees around it. And in my humanness, I expected that that sunflower, if it had feelings, might feel a bit bothered by so many bees landing on it all at once. So that was my projection. And I went into the state of stillness, intended to connect to the sunflower, and I asked the sunflower, how do you experience the bees? And the most beautiful answer came that my mind interpreted into the words, the bees kiss me with their awareness. Mm. And that's how the sunflower experienced bees, being kissed by the bees' awareness. So the most amazing visceral experiences and often very simple and profound wisdoms and truths are available by connecting with nature. They're short, but they're very sweet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes. The question is, have I had any communication with sharks? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, for the documentary, they wanted to include a shoot with me free diving, no wetsuit, no tanks or anything in the ocean off Cape Town with great white sharks and to have a shark approach in an attacking manner and for me to talk the shark out of it. So <laughs> I said that if we did that, it should be the very last sequence we shot because <laughs> anyway, circumstances didn't, didn't lead to that. <laughs> Um, but yes, I have connected with sharks. They are highly, highly intelligent. They absolutely know what they're doing and why they're doing. They are not aggressive towards people. But the way sharks test objects is by biting them. That's how they test. They have an amazing sense of smell, and they test things by mouthing them. You know, they'll bite first, think later. And that's what often happens in so-called shark attacks. They take a little bite of a surfer, probably spit it out and think that's a bad idea, and don't come back for more. <laughs> 
but unfortunately a little snack on a surfer might be fatal for that surfer. So yes, I've had many communications with sharks. About a year ago, the city of Cape Town um, employed my services to communicate with all the sharks in the area because they were considering a shark net. They wanted to know how the sharks felt about the shark net and the, the, the problems with that. Many, many sea animals die. They wanted to know how they felt about research programs that are taking some out of the ocean, tagging them and releasing them. They wanted to know why the sharks were inshore and close near some beaches. And the answer to that was, because the Navy, not too far away, had a certain configuration of beacons they were sending signals to in their testing, and the sharks were literally attracted by this electrical activity. It was very curious to them, and they were always going there to find out what it was. They were attracted by these electric signals from, from the beacon. Yeah, And many, many surfers um, speak of sharks being kind, you know, gentle, just curious, and just simply in the water with them. And sharks do feel our prejudice um, against them as well. The, the man who wrote the, the book and the movie, Jaws, he passed away a couple of years ago and um, he was terminally ill for a while, so he had time to write an open letter. He wrote an open letter that was published in the press where he apologised most deeply for what he had done by writing those stories. He says he apologises most deeply, it's the worst thing he's ever done. He is so very sorry because of what it has caused. Um, and the distress that sharks are suffering as a result. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, in your recent communications, um, have the animals been saying anything about the global climate change? Or, mm -hmm. I mean, um, have species been communicating to you and, and, mm -hmm. and wondering what's going on? Or have you been telling them things? Or what mm -hmm. has there been anything happening? Because. Mm -hmm. Do you understand my question? I do, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, they do literally experience the oceans, oceans heating up around them for those that are in the oceans and the drying up of water holes on the lands. Um, so they know what's going on. They understand it's because of our rampant resource abuse. So they understand that we are responsible, but they wouldn't really have the feeling of blame. I'm just always so amazed at the compassion that all animals show towards us humans. I'm amazed there hasn't been some major uprising against us, because there are several species that could injure us if they wanted to. But they absolutely understand that we're kind of lost ourselves, that us humans are lost, and they have such compassion for our lostness, and are so concerned for our souls and for our well-being, even though they are at the receiving end of a lot of the very ill effects of our actions. And they know, in many cases, that extinction of species and their own demise and all horrible situations or swimming in a toxic soup that the ocean is these days is causing them physical difficulty, illness, pain, discomfort. And yet they are very accepting as a, as a quality of being. They absolutely accept uh, what is happening. Um, but they are very aware of why it's happening. Animals, too, perform many functions we don't even know about. For example, the elephants' migratory paths across the lands actually follow major energy grid lines and ley lines. And so, too, the migratory paths of whales and dolphins in the sea follow those same magnetic lines and ley lines, essentially holding together the, the grid of the Earth. So there's such a stabilizing role that the animals are playing by being on the planet. And we've got no idea what we're doing by tugging on the strand of the web of life. The whole web does shake, and they all feel the wobble. So they do know, um, if, if they are going extinct, it isn't some overt decision on their, on their part. They're not saying, well, we've had enough, we're getting out of here, you know, so long and thanks for all the fish, to quote Douglas Adams. <laughs> um, they're not deciding to leave, they are leaving as a result of our, our actions on a, on a physical level. Yeah, and yet they stand in compassion, and are very willing to connect with us and to still just, even through their distress, show us what we're doing. That's why more and more these days, in recent years, beachings are happening on very populated beaches. Beachings of sea, sea animals are happening on very populated beaches, so that many, many humans are around and very aware and get touched or moved or inspired to at least consider how they're living their lives. It doesn't mean everyone has to dash out and be an activist in the doing sense, it does mean we can think about what chemicals we're throwing down our drains at home, what resources we're using. It does mean when we sit quietly on our own, do we sit with good thoughts and good feelings or do we focus on the negative? These are all things we can do. 
We can also be involved in many forms of sacred activism, which would be right from the comfort of our own armchair, meditation, like happens for the bees here and for nature, prayer, whatever modality calls to us, this is how we can really make a difference. Most of all, we need to be that difference, as Gandhi said. Thank you. We have time for one more can, question. Can I about domesticated animals? I can't see. I is okay. Uh, and especially horses. Yeah. I mean, their awareness and their connection mm. to humans must be stronger than the wild ones, mm. especially horses. And I wanted mm. wanted to hear about your experience with those. Okay. Uh, domestic animals have travelled quite a journey out of being wild um, and come to live close with humans, often against their will in the beginning. Um, but now much more willingly also. First of all, I find it an amazing act of trust on the part of domestic animals that they've given over even their most basic right to feed themselves by just trusting someone will come home and give them food because they're locked in a house or in a paddock all day. So even their most basic self-determining right has been taken away from them and they trust us. And speaking in more general terms, over the course of history, I've often got messages, well, I have messages that animals have come out of the wild to be close to humans, to help us get in touch with our true nature again. So it's often as if domestic animals are the bridge between us modern humans and our own wild nature, meaning our nature's inside. And it's often through having direct contact with an animal of any kind, an animal at home, that we just relax and be or that we come to hear ourselves, our real selves speaking, that we come to know our own nature. And so they're a very, very valuable bridge and the most fabulous companions and guides as well. Yeah.